good afternoon everyone hello uh, welcome can you hear me okay that's good so welcome to power systems one lecture seven um, in today's lecture uh, i'm gonna talk about um, the first component in any uh, power system you know that one of the main components in any power systems uh, which is the synchronous generator i mean how to model a generator and how to uh, use a generator in power system analysis okay so today's uh, lecture is mainly about synchronous uh, machines uh, of course i'm not gonna go through the details of machine uh, modeling but i will give you uh, insights about how to model a synchronous generator and uh, by the end of of of, uh, of this presentation or this topic, you will you will be able to understand how a synchronous generator can control uh, its active and reactive power injections into a power system, how it regulates uh, its output voltage, and so on. Okay. So before starting today's lecture, I would like to remind you about what we have discussed in the previous lecture. So uh, in lecture six, we talked about the third phase analysis. Okay, so if we have a three phase system, um, we have store delta connected loads. Uh, we have to solve uh, the system or the circuit per phase because the system is balanced. This is uh, the very important condition in order to uh, apply uh, this analysis. I mean the third phase analysis, and typically it is affiliated or it belongs to phase A. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we solved example five in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, in today's lecture, I will uh, solve example six. I mean to complete uh, this presentation because we we uh, we didn't have enough time last lecture. I mean to solve this example. Okay. Uh, again, this this problem is about pair phase analysis. Uh, we uh, we actually convert the three phase circuit into an equivalent single phase circuit, and we apply uh, the circuit theories uh, like Kirchhoff voltage law, Kirchhoff current law, uh, all the the principles that we learned from the second year to analyze a single phase circuit. Uh, the outputs we get or the results we get from a single phase um, are related to phase a as i mentioned but you can easily get the uh you can map the, these results to phases b and c uh, because the system is balanced okay so let's begin by solving uh, example six so let me zoom in a little bit um okay so in, the, in this example we have a three-phase line this is the, the three-phase line between the source and two loads, as you can see. Uh, the line feeds two balanced three-phase loads that are connected in parallel. The first load uh, is absorbing 516.1 kilovolt amp at this power factor, which is 0 0.707. So we have the complex power consumed by the first load. The second load also consumes active power at unity power factor. So as you can see in this example, the two loads are represented by their power consumptions, not by their impedances. In the previous example, I gave you the impedances, like uh, the first one was star connected, the second one is delta connected, uh, and the loads are represented by uh, constant impedances. This is not the typical case in power systems. In power systems, uh, the, mo the, the, the common load model is the constant power load. For instance, if you buy like um, an induction motor uh, or an appliance, like gives you the rated power of this appliance, like let's say uh, half horsepower or one horsepower, two horsepower, uh, even electric vehicles, uh, their motors are rated based on the uh, the active power consumption, uh, like in kilowatt. Okay, so most of the loads 
are not represented by their impedances. It is actually very hard to calculate the impedance of, uh, of, uh, of, of loads because the impedance is time varying. It depends on the operating condition. It depends on the temperature, um, the time of the day, uh, many factors, maybe the speed of the motor. So as you studied in electromechanical systems, uh, if we are modeling an induction motor, this induction motor uh, produces a, a mechanical torque, and the mechanical torque is a function of the motor speed. Um, so for instance, if we go to our notes, this is, uh, let me, right here. So this is lecture seven. So if we have an induction motor connected to a supply like this, this is the supply, which let's say um, 120 volts or uh, 208 volt, three phase. This is single phase. So the induction motor uh, is represented by uh, leakage, reactance, uh, resistance for the stator and, and, and rotor windings. We have mag magnetization reactance here. Okay. And the load is represented by a resistance. And this resistance is a function of the slip, the machine slip. So let's say R dash over S. This is the machine slip. This is not the Laplace uh, operator. Okay. And this slip is uh, is the difference between the rated speed and the rotor speed, okay? And using this circuit uh, in, 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 the, in the electromechanical uh, course, we plotted uh, a line that represents the relationship between the torque and the speed, which is something like that. So we have starting torque, uh, we have uh, zero torque at the rated speed uh, and we have to operate we have to make a deviation between the rated speed and the rotor speed in order to produce a useful torque so this is the output torque okay uh, so what I want to explain here is the impedance seen from the supply is not constant the impedance of the induction motor is variable And it is a function of the motor slip. It is a function of the torque and speed and so on. Okay. So typically we represent we represent loads using their power consumption, not their load consumption. Uh, and by the way, this is a single load. Suppose we have different loads supplied by the grid. Let's say we have a house here. And this house is getting power from a uh, power pool. We have a transformer here, the transformer drum. And then we have a line connecting uh, the grid to the house. But inside this house, we have many appliances. We have induction motors. We have heaters. We have um, electronic loads, uh, for instance, uh, uh, like computers. We have uh, also may have like a charger, an electric vehicle charger, EV charger. Okay, so uh, represent like here every component, every equipment uh, or appliance here in this house has a variable impedance. And if you want to calculate the equivalent impedance, this is near impossible. We cannot do that. Every impedance here is variable, and those impedances are nonlinear. They depend, like they depend on the voltage, the frequency uh, of the supply. So it is not practical or possible or visible to represent the load using a constant impedance. So how we represent loads in power system analysis? We typically represent them using their active and reactive power consumptions. And those active and reactive power consumptions could be variable uh, depending on the voltage, uh, as you will see. 
uh, depending on the uh, load characteristics. Uh, so I will I will give you uh, a brief explanation on how uh, the load model or the consumption by the load varies as a function of the voltage and frequency as we uh, reach uh, the power flow analysis by the end of, of this course. Okay, but what I wanted you to know that uh, we use the the power model to represent loads. This is very common in power systems. Okay, let's go back to the example. So in example six, we have two loads connected in parallel. Um, the second load is represented by the active and the power factor, uh, the line-to-line -line voltage. Uh, at the load of the line is given. This is another uh, factor uh, that we need to uh, look at. Typically, typically, the voltage across the load is controlled because loads are sensitive to voltage variations. Okay, so we typically control the voltage across the load. The supply here is the substation. The substation, the substation equipment uh, are not that sensitive to the load variation. What is really sensitive is the load. So, for instance, if you have uh, lighting loads, uh, the lamp. If the voltage drops, you will see a reduction in the uh, illumination or the light coming out from the lamp. Uh, you may see the lamp flickering. Okay, so we regulate the voltage across the across the load, and typically it is the other way uh, around. Like we start from the load and go back to the supply to see what is the voltage needed at the substation terminal to keep the the, the load voltage regulated and uh, near the rated value. So that is why in this problem, I gave you the voltage across the load, not the voltage of the supply. If we go back to example five, it is pretty much ideal, like loads are represented by their impedances. Uh, we have the voltage of the supply, not the voltage across the load. And we want to calculate the voltage across the load. But in example six, I gave you the power consumption of the load, I give you the voltage needed across the load to keep them operating uh, properly, okay? Um, okay, so we got the information. Uh, the question here is to determine the magnitude of the line voltage at the source end of the line. So we need to get V1, okay? So let's solve this problem. I'm gonna move the PowerPoint presentation to the other screen, and let's solve this. Uh, so we have two loads. So this is example number six. We have S2, we have S1, we have the line impedance, and this is I from the supply, this is V1. And the voltage across the load is V2, and it is given, it is 2200 with angle zero. And here we have I1, I2, okay? And the first question is to get the line voltage of the supply. So we need to get, num we get the, uh, V1. This is the first question, okay? Okay, so to get uh, V1, we need to get the current from the supply, okay? So V1 is equal to V2 plus the voltage drop across the line. So we have the line impedance times the current. We got the line impedance, we have V2, okay? But we don't know I. But we can apply Kirchhoff current law I at this node. We know that I is equal to I1 plus I2, okay? So how to get I1 and I2? To get I1, we need to know the complex power consumed by the first load. So S1 is given. So S1 as a magnitude is 560.1 kVA. And the power factor, is 0 
Okay. To get I1, to get I1, we know that S1 in the complex form is equal to V1 I1 conjugate. V1 I1 conjugate. But remember, this is a three phase circuit. So don't forget three. So three V1 I1. And V1 here is the uh, the phase to neutral voltage or the line to neutral voltage. This is not the line to line. If it is the line to line, then we have to use root three instead of three. Okay. So how to get I1, uh, sorry, how to get S1 as a complex number? We got the magnitude. Remember, we got the magnitude of S1 and we have the power factor. So if you go to the power triangle, this is S1 as a magnitude. And this is phi, the power factor angle. This is P and Q. So let me put it in general like this. This is S and P and Q. So we know that S is equal to P in general. This is a general uh, equation. S is equal to P plus JQ. Okay. And S is equal to the magnitude of S with angle phi. And the angle phi is the power factor angle. So phi here is cos inverse, the power factor. The power factor is given. Okay, so you can easily calculate or get S1 in the complex form. Once you get S1 in the complex form, you can calculate I1. So I1 is S1 over V1 divided by 3, of course. And this is conjugate. And here is also conjugate. So this is I1. Now let's calculate I2. For the second load, for the second load, we got for the second load, we got the power. The power of the second load is 132 kilowatt. And the power factor is unity at unity power factor. This means, this means that the angle of S2 is zero because unity power factor means there is no reactive power. But in general, if I give you a power factor, so S2 in general is equal to what? As a magnitude. S2 as a magnitude is equal to P2 over the power factor. I got this relation from uh, the power factor definition. We know that the power factor is equal to P over S as a magnitude. So if you want to get S, so it is going to be P over the power factor. In our case here, we have 132 kilowatt over 1 because the power factor is 1. So you get the magnitude of S2. The angle phi 2 or the angle of S2, which is phi 2, is cos inverse the power factor 2 which is 1, so this is 0. So we got S2. Similarly, you can get I2. So I2 is equal to S2 conjugate over 3V2 conjugate. You have now I1 and I2. You can calculate. Let's, let me go up. You can calculate I, the total current. And from the total current, you can get V1. The voltage you get from the first equation, which I started the solution with, is the phase to neutral voltage or the line to neutral voltage. This is not the line voltage needed in the first requirement. So after getting V1 from the first equation, so V1 uh, line to line as a magnitude is equal to V1 phase times root 3. This is the first requirement. Okay. The second requirement, this is A. The second requirement is to get the total re real and reactive power loss in the line. Let me share with you the screen. So we need to get the total real and reactive power loss in the line. The, the power consumed or dissipated in the line. So this line consumes active power because it has a resistance consumes reactive power because it has a reactance, okay? So how to get this power? Very simple. Let me go this way. 
So S line has two components, active power and reactive power. Okay, so we have a resistance and an inductance. The resistance consumes active power and the reactance consumes reactive power. So how to get that? We have the current. So, and you have, this is the resistance of the line. So this is R line and this is X line. Okay, so P line from that definition is I squared times R line by definition because the current uh, flows through the line through the resistance of the line and don't forget don't forget to multiply by three because we have three lines for the reactive power same thing it is i squared times x line and don't forget the three this is how we calculate the power losses there is another way to calculate the power losses uh, in the line so we know that we have the source we have the line and we have two loads okay so you can calculate the complex re, uh, the complex power supplied by the source I'm gonna call it s source and you have the complex power consumed by the first load and the second load I'm talking here about complex uh power not just the magnitude remember okay and then we can um, apply uh, the conservation rule we know that the total power from the source is equal to s1 plus s2 plus s line we got s1 as a complex number we have s2 as a complex number and for s source it is very easy we can calculate it. S source is equal to 3 V1 times I conjugate. So you have all the components of this equation except S line. So you can get S line. This is a different way to calculate the power losses. Okay. Now let's look at the third requirement. We need to calculate the real power and React the force supplied at the sending end of the line, which I just calculated. So this is S source. So this is S source, number C. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now let's move to the main topic. Of today's lecture which is the synchronous generator I think I got a question what is 3 v1 i1 uh, from again okay so 3 1 let me go here 3 1 v uh, 3 v1 i1 conjugate is the power consumed the power supplied by the source so this source has a voltage v1 and the current from this source is I the total current supplying the two loads here we have i1 and i2 Okay. So if you want to calculate the complex power from the source, you have to multiply its voltage by the current conjugate. The current, this is the current coming from the source. And don't forget the factor three because this is a three-phase uh, source. Okay. Okay. So now let's switch to the synchronous generator. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, so the outline uh, of this presentation first, I'll give you an introduction about synchronous uh, generators, uh, like the types of synchronous uh, generators. Uh, and then we, we are gonna talk about how to model a synchronous generator, okay? And the model here, the model here will be a steady state model. Steady state model. This model is important, is important for power flow, power flow studies and short circuit analysis, short circuit 
current calculations. Okay, so uh, there is, of course, uh, dynamic models uh, which include differential equations and um, the controller dynamics and all these things. These models uh, are used in stability studies, in stability studies, and the stability topic is very important in, in power system analysis, but uh, it's a little bit advanced. So I, I, I leave it to power systems uh, too, or grad studies. Okay, so the, the focus of uh, this course is, uh, is actually on power flow. So this is our ultimate goal, is to understand how the power uh, flows from the sources to the loads and how uh, we manage the power. Okay? So we don't need a dynamic model. Our focus will be on a steady state analysis. Okay? In today's lecture, hopefully, I cover the first three items in uh, the presentation outline. And in the next lecture, I will talk about voltage regulation and power factor control uh, and power angle uh, characteristics. Okay? So this, this is today's lecture, hopefully. Uh, this is seven, lecture seven, and this is lecture eight. Okay, let me begin. Okay, so as we know, synchronous generators, or some in some textbooks, they call it alternators, they convert mechanical power uh, drive from steam, gas, or hydro turbine to AC electric power. So we know that we have a turbine, and this turbine converts the, 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 the steam or the thermal energy so we have the boiler here. This is the boiler. We have the turbine. And the boiler generates uh, like high uh, uh, steam at high temperatures and high pressure. We have the turbine. And then we have the mechanical energy. We have the generator. Our generator is here. And we get the electricity. OK? Uh, we typically use synchronous generators because they operate at constant speed. They operate at constant speed. And the speed is proportional to the frequency. Okay? If we want to keep the frequency constant, we have to select a machine that runs at constant uh, speed. And this is, uh, this is the synchronous generator. So uh, we don't use, we don't typically use induction uh, machines to generate electricity, unless, unless those induction machines are coupled uh, or interfaced through power electronic converters. So for instance, in some special machines, such as the double fed induction generators used in wind turbines, they use induction generator. And the induction generator operates at different uh, speeds. Why different speeds? Because we need to track the maximum power generated from wind. And when, when, when speeds uh, are variable, or when speed is variable, and as a result, we need also a machine, uh, a flexible machine, a machine that, that can run at different speeds. But the frequency coming out is variable. The frequency coming out is variable. Uh, so we have to, inter we have to use like back-to-back uh, -back power electronic converters, like AC to DC, and then DC to AC to uh, make this induction generator uh, track the maximum power uh, from, from wind and uh, control its performance, whether voltage, frequency, and so on. So we need power electron converters. Uh, and, and this is called type, type 3. This is one turbine type 3. This is type 3. There's type 4, type 4. And type 4 uses a synchronous generator but variable at variable speed. This is a synchronous generator, but the power electron converters will be installed on the stator, not just the rotor. Here we have the rotor. Here we have the stator of the machine. So we need like uh, a power electronic converter at high capacity that, that actually handles the full rating of the machine. There are other types of wind turbines like type 1 and 2. Those two types are fixed speed or uh, have limited 
control over the speed of the of the machine but as i told you typically in power plants like steam based gas based hydro we use synchronous generators because they don't need power electronic converters okay um, so this is the typical generator used in our power plants okay um, also we may use synchronous motors in some uh, factories but the the application or of or um, the usage of synchronous uh, motors is not as common as synchronous generators why because synchronous motors ha have to run at constant speed and this is not typically useful in, in factories like in factories we need to control the speed of the motor like for example uh, run at medium speed high speed low speed i mean to control the process okay so synchronous motors are not that um you know famous or common in uh, industrial plants but synchronous generators on the other hand they are the com they are very common uh used in, in power generation because we can get the benefit out of uh this feature which is the constant speed okay now let's talk about the components or the structure of this synchronous generator we have two major parts we have the stator as you know for any for any uh, ac machine or dc machine we have a stator and a rotor as you can see this is the stator it is a stationary and we have the rotor that is coupled to uh, the turbine the steam turbine or the gas turbine okay and depending on the type depending on the type of the rotor we can classify synchronous generators so the stator is typically the same for all types but the rotor may change so we may have a cylindrical or salient uh, rotors and in this case the the machine will be called based on the rotor type it could be cylindrical synchronous uh, generator or uh, a salient synchronous generator okay and i will explain the differences between the two types in the next slides so let's begin by the cylindrical synchronous generator so uh, the, the cylindrical rotor uh, type of rotor is also called round rotor. So as you can see, the rotor itself, this is the stator, and this is the rotor. The rotor itself is, is, is round, and the air gap between the stator and the rotor is uniform. We have a uniform air gap. Okay. Uh, because of this construction, because of this construction, um, we have only one reactance, I, I mean mutual reactance between the stator and the rotor because the air gap, as you can see, is uniform. If it is, as you will see in the cilium pole, it is not uniform, then we have to define uh, different uh, reactances, coupling reactances. Okay. Um, these generators are driven by steam turbines and are designed for high speeds. Why? Because when we have a round rotor, we cannot make many pools we cannot make many pools so for, for here for instance we have the north and the south we have only two pools here so this rotor is only two pools okay we cannot increase the number of pools when we have a round route because the the magnetic field generated by the coil so this coil is basically if you imagine this is a cross-section area like this so we have like a wire and then we turn it like this and yeah when you make a cut you see these dots so from this coil you can see that we have only if you apply the right hand rule you know the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field so let's say if the current is passing let me use my notes. Okay, so if we have a coil like this, okay, and the current is passing in this direction, okay, so the magnetic field generated, if you apply the right hand rule, if you go with your um, if you go with your fingers, I mean, in this direction, with the current direction, and your thumb is actually 
will point to the direction of the magnetic field. So the direction of the magnetic field will be in this direction. Okay, so we have the north and south. So these two, this is one magnet. This is actually, this is the south, this is the north. So we have here, in this configuration, we have two poles. Okay, and if you, if you have, uh, if you have, if you coil, if you coil the rotor uh, using this configuration, you generate only two poles. That is why round rotors have limited number of poles, maximum four. You cannot uh, coil more than four poles. Otherwise, you know, the, the magnetic field generated will be uh, overlap, overlapping, will be overlapping. This is the problem of round rotors. And there is a relation, there is a relation between uh, the number of poles and the speed of uh, the machine. So if you have low number of poles, then the speed will be high, very high. So the speed is inversely proportional to the number of poles. And that is why this type of machine is used with steam turbines. Steam turbines run at high speeds, run at, run at high speeds, like 1800 or uh, 3600 RPM. So round rotors would, uh, are typically used with steam turbines or thermal power plants. And that is why this is very common in power generation, like nuclear uh, power plants, uh, coal-fired, uh, gas-based, uh, steam-based uh, power plants. They, they use round or cylindrical synchronous generators. Okay? So almost 70% of generators have round rotors ranging from 150 to 15, uh, 1.5 giga MVA. So this is 150 MVA to 1500 MVA. This is, this is actually huge. This is huge. This is 1.5 giga full time. Okay. So for, 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 like for your reference, like one generator can supply an entire city. One synchronous generator can supply an entire city. So, as far as I remember, the total load consumed by the city of Windsor is 800 MVA. So maybe a medium size, a medium size generator, a medium size synchronous generator may supply the entire load of city of Windsor. Okay. Uh, okay. Now uh, let's look at the construction. So I told you the stator is common between the round and the uh, the ceiling pole. But if you look at the rotor, the rotor has to be manufactured to be long, to be very long, um, you know, to limit the centrifugal forces. I told you this type of machine runs at high speeds. So to limit the centrifugal forces, you have to uh, build the rotor to be long, okay? Uh, uh, the small diameter, again, this is uh, when you make it long, then you don't need to have it I mean, you don't need to make a large diameter, okay? Uh, this is the first time. The second time is the cilium pool rotor. So this is how it looks when you look at the cross-section area, and this is in practice. So we have different, as you can see, different pools. Like we can have, we can increase the number of pools in this, uh, in this type of generators. And as a result, I told you that the, the speed is proportion is inversely proportional for, proportional to the number of poles. So if you can increase the number of poles, then you can decrease the speed. And that is why this type of machine is suitable for hydroelectric power stations. Because the, the hydro turbine does not run at high speeds as compared to steam turbines or gas-based turbines. They run at low speeds ranging from 50 to 300 RPM, okay? So typically, we use this machine with hydro uh, electric power uh, stations. Now let's talk about the principle of operation of this machine. So the rotor of the generator is driven by the prime mover. The prime mover here is the turbine, the steam turbine or the gas turbine, okay? Then a DC current flows in the rotor winding. And this DC current produces rotating magnetic field uh, within the, the, the AC machine. So we have the stator. I told you we have the stator. This is the stator. And we have the rotor. This rotor, R, uh, 
has like winding like uh, for example many coils here and other coils here and so on so if we have four poles so this could be north south and then south and north something like that okay so we have different we have different uh poles but the, the, the winding of the rotor is supplied by a DC source. So as the prime mover uh, spins, you know, the rotor, the, the constant, the constant magnetic field generated by this DC source will be rotating. Will be rotating. Imagine you have a coil like this. And this is the generated magnetic field. But this coil is not constant. It is not stationary. It rotates. So the DC current flowing and the rotor winding will produce a rotating magnetic field. A rotating magnetic field. And this rotating magnetic field will generate uh, like induced voltage in the stator winding. Okay. Now let's look at the frequency. The electrical frequency produced is locked or synchronized to the mechanical speed. And this is the relation between the frequency and the, uh, the mechanical speed n. So n here is the mechanical speed in RPM. P is the number of poles. And F is the electrical frequency in hertz. So if we have a machine uh, of two poles, then the frequency will be two uh, sorry, the, the speed. So the speed will be 120F divided by P, which is uh, 3600 RPM. If we have four poles, then the speed will be 1800 RPM. Okay. And these are the typical speeds in steam-based power plants. But if we have, let's say, 10 pools, something like that, then you have 120 times 60 over 10. So you get uh, 360, or you get actually 720 RBM, something very low in the range of go back yeah we may actually use more than 10 so if you look here if you can count this this is more than 10 poles so we have one two three four five six seven eight nine so it is almost 18 something like that this is 18 maybe 18, 18 poles or uh, something around that okay so this is how we calculate the mechanical speed and this is the relation between the frequency so we have to keep the mechanical speed constant and that is why steam-based uh, turbines, or I mean the turbine or the, the prime mover, uh, mover has to control the mechanical speed. And to control the mechanical speed and make it constant, we have to use a governor. This governor, which is not uh, our focus in this course, it is related to the mechanical system of the power plant. This governor controls the mechanical speed. We have to keep the mechanical speed constant, let's say at 1800 RPM or 3600 RPM to guarantee that the frequency is constant, okay? Now let's look at the model. Okay, we need a model. What is the model? We need a circuit or a model that represent the synchronous generator in order to use this circuit or this model in our power system analysis, okay? So transmission lines, uh, they are represented by circuits. Uh, transformers are represented by an equivalent circuit. Loads could be represented by impedances or uh, typically represented by the power consumptions. So we need a model to represent the synchronous generator. In, in the previous examples, which I saw with I I used a very simple model to represent the machine. I just used a voltage source. So this voltage source cannot represent a machine, cannot represent a machine. There, there are a lot of details, as 
you will see by the end of today's lecture. Okay, uh, there is like a resistance for the stator windings, there is like mutual uh, reactance between the stator and the rotor. So we have to consider, just a second. Okay. Sorry, guys, for the interruption. Okay. Okay. So, um, so back here, uh, where we are. Okay. So here, um, I told you, like in the previous examples, we used a very simple model to represent uh, the source. But this is very ideal. This is ideal model. We cannot use it to represent synchronous generators. So this could be good for representing a huge power system. Let's say the power system of Ontario. Uh, the power system of a country. Because um, this country like has surplus power, a lot of power plants uh, that can regulate, that can regulate the voltage, magnitude, and angle and, and, and emulate, emulate an ideal source, a source that can give us infinite power, relatively, of course. Okay? But in reality, if we have a simple generator supplying a remote community and one line, something like that, no, this is not a good representation or an accurate representation for the synchronous generator. So now let's look at the, um, the, the, the structure of the generator. As I told you, we have stator windings and we have rotor windings. The stator is three phase. So the stator is something like that. The stator is three phase. This is the stator, phase A, B, and C, and the rotor is DC. It is supplied by a DC source, like that. Okay, so this is the rotor. Okay, uh, so if you if you make a cross section, uh, you know, um, on the on the rotor, like on the machine. So this is the machine. Imagine that this is a cylinder, and you make a cut in this cylinder, you would see uh, the stator winding. So this is phase A. This is phase A. OK. And of course, like if you make any coil like this, and you make a cut, you would see that the, the current may enter one point and, leave, and should leave the other point. So this is, let's say, the input. This is the current. The current is actually toward the, the screen. It is entering the cross section area. And when it is X, it means that it is leaving. OK. Uh, same thing for uh, phase B and then C. So we have three windings for the stator. We have the rotor winding. And here, for simplicity, we, uh, we will consider only two poles, not four poles. OK, so we have, again, the input current, the DC current is entering here and leaving here. OK, um, so I think yeah, it is the other way. Uh, so the X means it is N because the direction of the field is in this direction. So X means it is N, and the dot means it is leaving. So if you apply the right hand rule, I hope you can see my hand. Let me check and see. So the input is like this. This is the dot. Uh, this is, sorry, the x, the x here, this x. So the current is entering the cross-section area, and the dot is leaving, like this. So if you apply the right-hand rule, like you enter, and then you go back like this, so the direction of the flux 
will be up. Okay, so this is for the field windings. And we have, of course, the stator windings. Um, so now, uh, the idea, as I told you, we need to get a model. We need to get a circuit that represents, uh, that represents, I mean, the generator in our analysis. And this circuit uh, will be a steady state model. Okay, uh, we, we're not gonna consider differential equations or any dynamics in the generator. I told you this is good for different studies. If your study is related to stability, then you have to add more details to the model complicated more in order to study the dynamics, the stability, uh, the eigenvalues, the, you know, uh, apply uh, the stability criteria, like, uh, you know, you check the right and left hand uh, sides of the S-plane. Okay. Okay. So now we understand that we have stator windings, three phase. So those are the stator windings, three phase. And we have a DC winding for the rotor. And I told you, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that all the, all the windings of the rotor are concentrated in two points. So we know that the, um, the winding is uniformly distributed across uh, the rotor. Like, let's go back. Like this, for instance, look. We have different points. But I'm assuming that all points are concentrated in the center one here. Same thing, all these points, all these uh, coils are concentrated in the middle one. Okay, and we'll take uh, the, this distribution, this distribution of, of coils uh, into account uh, using a factor. Okay? But for now, for simplicity, everything will be concentrated on two points uh, to, to make one uh, magnetic field, I mean rotating magnetic field from the south to the north. Okay. Now we know that this rotor rotates. So this screenshot uh, happens at one specific angle. Okay, so omega t here is the angle between this axis And the, the 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 generated magnetic field. So omega t is from here to here. Okay, and as this rotor, the middle one, rotates, like this, uh, this magnetic like this magnetic field generated by the rotor will also move. Like this vector f r, the magnetic field generated by the rotor will move. Like this. Okay, so um, the flux linkage between the stator winding depends on the rotor position. What is the flux linkage? The flux linkage basically is uh, if you have two coils, let's say a coil like this, and another coil like this. So this, the first coil, let's say it generates magnetic field in this direction. The second coil, okay, uh, also generates magnetic field in this direction. I'm gonna make it in using dots. So from, from what you see here, the flux produced by the first coil fully links, fully links the second coil. Why? Because both fluxes have the same direction, have the same direction. But if one coil is not coinciding, is not coinciding with the other, then not all the flux produced by one coil will be coupling the other coil. Or it, we, we may have no flux at all, may, no flux at all coupling uh, the second coil. And this is what happens here. If you look at phase A, Phase A, this is A, and apply the right hand uh, rule. Phase A uh, generates flux in this direction. Okay, so let's say the current uh, at A enters A dash and leaves A like this. So it enters A and leaves A 
enter, enters A dash and leaves A, so the direction of the flux of uh, the first winding will be in this direction. For the rotor, the, the flux uh, or the current enters R dash in this direction and leaves in, uh, from R, the second point, so that is why the direction is up. Okay, so when omega t, when omega t is equal to 90 degrees, which is the case in, in the current figure, the flux produced by phase A is as indicated in this figure in this direction, in the horizontal direction, but the flux generated by the rotor will be in the vertical direction, like this. So there is no link. There is no link between the two fluxes. Okay? And that is why the flux linkage, lambda A, will be zero. But if omega t is equal to zero, which means phase A or R and R dash, R would be here. This is R, R dash, and R will be here. So as you can see, the two coils have the same axis, have the same axis, center, center axis. So the flux produced by the, 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 the rotor would be coinciding uh, with the flux produced by phase A. And in this case, we get the maximum linkage. We get the maximum linkage. And the maximum linkage is basically phi. This is the flux generated by the rotor times the number of coils in phase A. This is how we calculate the flux linkage. OK, so if this is the case, if at omega t the flux is maximum, and when omega, uh, at omega t equals 0, the flux is maximum, and when omega t is equal uh, 90 degrees, the flux is minimum, is 0. So this can be modeled using a cosine function. Because if you look at the, uh, the wave shape of the cosine function, it is like this. So when, omega, when the angle is 90 degrees, we get zero. When the angle is zero, we get the maximum. So this is how we model the flux linkage lambda A. Now, the induced voltage in the stator coil A and A dash can be obtained using Faraday's law. So EA, which is the induced voltage in phase A, is negative delta lambda dt. So we can get uh, EA. Okay. And this EA has, of course, a maximum. This will be the maximum voltage induced in the stator winding. Okay, uh, so it can be represented using a sine function or a cosine function. Those two, these two representations are valid and good. Okay, if you look at the maximum voltage induced, uh, it is proportional to uh, the number of turns, uh, the frequency, and the flux. Okay, so, and the RMS, if we, if we want to get the RMS, we divide this maximum voltage by root 2. So, in general, the RMS value of the induced voltage is given by this equation. Okay. This is something you studied before. Okay, remember the assumption I told you that we concentrated all the, the turns into one turn, which is in the center of the rotor, but this is this is uh, an assumption. This is actually an, an approximation to simplify the analysis. But the effect of these coils, uh, the effect of this coil can be taken into consideration by a factor called the winding factor. So the produced voltage or the generated induced voltage is lower than the value uh, generated here because this value assumes ideal conditions. It assumes that all windings are concentra concentrated uh, uh, in one coil, which is in the center. But of course, as you distribute windings, then the flux generated by the rotor will not be exactly uh, aligned with the flux generated by uh, phase A winding. Okay? So, so there will be a phase shift. This phase shift will, redu will reduce the resultant uh, induced voltage a little bit, not too much, but this phase shift has to be taken into consideration. And generally, we consider this winding factor K winding, uh, which is between 85% to 95%. Okay. Um, the magnetic field of the rotor rotates at omega. 
uh, and it induces three-phase sinusoidal voltage in the stator displaced by 120. So we ensure this displacement, which is 120, by placing the stator windings 120 degrees apart. So this is phase A. If you look at the uh, induced voltage by phase A, it is in this direction. If you look at phase B, it will be in this direction. So, uh, and phase C would be in this direction. So, the like physically, the stator windings are displaced uh, by 120 degrees apart. Okay, they're shifted or the distance physically is 120 degrees apart. And that is why the voltage induced in phase A will be uh, shifted by 120 degrees uh, from phase B and phase C. Of course, uh, I'm talking about the absolute displacement. Okay. Okay, now we know that if we have a standalone generator, a generator like this, which is not connected to the power system. So here we have the power system. And the circuit breaker, the breaker connecting the synchronous generator is, is off. Okay, and we are connecting this generator to a turbine. Okay, so the induced voltage here will be given by this equation. What happens when we close the breaker connecting the synchronous generator to the power system or the breaker that connects the generator to the load? What will happen? In this case, the generator will supply current to the load. And this current will flow through the stator winding. This current will pass or flow through the stator windings. Okay. This is the stator winding. It is three phase by A, B, and C. And of course, if the load is balanced, which is the case in our course, then uh, this 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 could be the expression for the current. And we typically have inductive loads. So the current will be lagging the voltage. This is the induced voltage, remember, the induced voltage E by uh, a phase shift phi. This is the power factor angle. Okay. Now we can define an axis called MN. This axis is perpendicular to IA. So the angle here between this axis, MN, and uh, phase A current is 90 degrees. Okay. Now if you look here, we have three vectors. We have the induced uh, voltage E, and this induced voltage lags the flux generated by the rotor by 90 degrees. Why is that? This is happening because of the drift, negative the drift. If you remember from the class transfer, D by DT in the frequency domain is translated to J omega. J omega. So J omega here is a phase shift by 90 degrees. Is a phase shift by 90 degrees. And, and you can even see it in this representation. So if you compare EA, this expression, this instantaneous uh, voltage, to the, the instantaneous uh, flux linkage. Look here. So the flux linkage has an angle of zero because omega t plus zero, there is no angle. But if you look at the induced voltage, it has a negative 90 degrees or negative pi over 2, which means the vector, the phasor of E is lagging or lags lambda A by 90 degrees. Okay. So we got the flux linkage, we got E, and we know that this is a voltage and the current will be lagging because most of the loads are inductive. Now we want to understand the impact of this current on the flux inside the air gap of the machine, the flux inside the air gap of the machine, because there is interaction, there is interaction between the stator and the rotor. Previously, the generator was not connected to the grid, and the current was zero. So we had only one flux linkage, that is lambda A. But now we have three phase currents through the stator windings, and those three phase currents, as you will see, will generate a rotating magnetic field. Okay, that will interact with the, 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 the magnetic field generated by the uh, root. Okay, so we have three currents because we have three stator windings. Uh, each one will generate MMF, 
magnetic field, okay, along the axis of the phase winding. Here, this is the MMF generated by the current. It will be along the axis of the current, okay? So uh, we have this expression. So as you can see, if you look at the uh, current instantaneous expression, uh, we have here uh, a factor that represents uh, the amount of flux generated by this current. And we have three, uh, three uh, components for the MMF with forms in case that is, is proportional to the number of armature turns. Okay, this is something that uh, we know from the electromagnetic uh, fields uh, course. Okay, so this current will produce three magnetic fields, FA, FB, FC, okay? Um, and the question now, how to integrate, how to integrate these magnetic fields into the circuit model, in the model of the uh, synchronous generator? These magnetic fields are not rotating, are not rotating. They are stationary. They are stationary because they are look like the stator windings are not rotating. So the idea here is to calculate the equivalent rotating magnetic field because of F, A, B, and C. And that is why I introduced this axis, M and N, which is perpendicular to the phase current IA. So we need to calculate two components. The result in phase component of the three fields, F, A, B, and C. Okay, so basically what we want to do is to map or uh, project F, A, B, and C on this axis, M and N. This is how we do the projection. So we get F, A. F, A is the in-phase component, the component that is aligned with this axis, M and N. Okay, so you do this multiplication. And we know that sine alpha to sine alpha is equal to half sine to alpha. So if you substitute, you end up getting this FA. This is the in-phase component. If you look at this in-phase component, it has three sinusoidal terms, three sinusoidal terms. And these terms are shifted by 120 degrees from each other. So they are balanced. These are balanced components, like something like that. They have the same magnitude which is equal to Fm over 2, and they are shifted by 120 degrees. So the summation is 0. If you add these three sinusoidal uh, functions together, you get a 0. So Fa is 0. The in-phase component aligned with Mn, the Mn axis, is equal to 0. How about the quadrature phase component? The quadrature phase component. So uh, what we do, we project these components on the, qu like the quadrature axis. This is the quadrature axis. Okay, We do this expression, and we know that sine squared alpha is given by this equation. So we end up getting this expression for F2. It has three sinusoidal components, balance it. So the submission of these three components uh, is equal to zero. But we still have a constant term here. So F2 has a constant amplitude, and it is equal to 3 over 2 Fm, okay? And this is the resultant uh, armature MMF. We're going to call it Fs. So the, the, the resultant uh, armature, armature here is the stator, basically. We call it the armature, okay? So the, the resultant stator MMF, which is Fs, okay? And uh, it has a constant amplitude perpendicular to the line MN. So this is FS, as you can see, using this purple vector. And it rotates at a constant speed. So what we did, basically, is to find the resultant rotating magnetic field due to the stator currents. You know, in order to understand how the stator magnetic field interacts with the rotor magnetic field. We cannot have stationary magnetic fields uh, and compare, compare it to a rotating magnetic field. We have to unify the frame that we are studying or working with. Okay, so yes, this is the, previously the generator was unloaded. It was disconnected from the grid, and that is why we had all the FR, the magnetic field from the rotor. 
When the generator supplies a load or is connected to the grid, it will generate current, and this current will generate a resultant magnetic field perpendicular to the line MN and is represented by FS. Any questions? Okay. Okay. So the resultant air gap, the resultant M air gap MMF, is the vector sum of the field and the armature MMFs. So now we have two components for the magnetic field. The one that that, that is actually in the air gap is the result of the submission of these two components. So you add this to this one. So, um, so when you add this is FS, add it to FR, you end up getting this component. Sometimes it is very hard to write on the presentation, but this is FSR. This is the resultant MMF in the air gap, okay? When the generator is open, this is the first case, we have only FR, which induces E. This E, we call it the no load voltage, the voltage that appears on the terminals of the generator when there is no load. So if the generator is like this, you have a breaker and you have the load or the, the power system, this is the network or the load. Okay, so the voltage you measure here it's gonna be E when the breaker is open. Okay, when the generator is connected to the grid or the load, FS induces a component because any magnetic field, any rotating magnetic field, will induce a voltage. Will induce a voltage. So FS, the stator magnetic field, which is uh, uh, which rotates. I mean, like the the, the magnetic field from the rotor induces e, EAR, and the resultant one, the resultant one, the resultant magnetic field, FSR, induces the on-load voltage, ESR. This could be a little bit vague, but to understand it, we have to look at the phasor diagram. We have to look at the phasor diagram. So we know that any uh, voltage, induced voltage, okay, uh, any induced voltage should be lagging its um, magnetic field by 90 degrees. So EER, this is EER, should be lagging uh, its magnetic field. But here, th there is here uh, a question, th there is here a note. EER leads FS, leads FS because here, uh, if you look at the equation, we have to go back to the equation. So if you look here at the equations that we got, in, for the in-phase component and the quadrature component, F2. If you look at F2, F2 has this magnitude and it is aligned with the current. It is aligned with the current. And, and, and as a result, as a result, the, the, there is no, it is not like using the Faraday's law like previously we did in the beginning of, of this model. In the, uh, in the beginning, if you remember, E, the induced voltage, was equal to negative d lambda by dt. And this negative sign made the voltage lags the induced, uh, the, the, the generated magnetic field. So look, if you look here, so this is FR. FR leads EA, or EA lags FR because of this negative sign. This is not the case for the rotating magnetic field generated by the state. Okay. Where is the phase background? So why I'm saying that, why I'm saying that, because this current, this current will generate a voltage. This voltage drop can be acted as a voltage drop because this E, uh, the induced voltage EER, 
leads IA by 90 degrees, and it can be modeled by a voltage drop across a reactance. This reactance, we call it the armature reaction. So it is the reaction between the stator and the rotor. The stator and the rotor. So in general, if you have a magnetic field, the magnetic field will generate an induced voltage. This, magne this magnetic field, uh, the, the induced voltage, would be an uh, will will be lagging or leading, depending on depending on uh, the source of this magnetic field. Okay, the source of this magnetic field it depends on the sign. Uh, using the rotor winding, we got this negative d lambda by dt, and that is why E was lagging f by 90 degrees. But for the stator, but for the stator uh, current. We don't have this negative sign. We don't have negative sign, and that is why E leads A, I A. Okay, okay. So now we have uh, E R. This E R uh, again. It is it leads I A by 90 degrees, which means it can be represented by a voltage drop across a reactance. If you remember, if you have a reactance like this, and you have a current through this reactance, the voltage. Across this reactance, I'm going to call it EER, will be leading the current because the current will be lagging by 90 degrees. This is IA. So if you have this relation, you have 90 degrees phase shift between E and I, you can represent this relation using a reactance. Okay, so for the first component, FS, the rotating magnetic field due to the state or current, we have a current lagging. A voltage by 90 degrees and we represent this relation using a reactance this reactance we call it the armature reaction reactance and that is why it is called xar okay um, now we have another as i told you we have another component fsr this is the resultant magnetic field it induces a voltage called esr so the total induced voltage is the summation of two components, ESR, and the one that is represented by a reactance, we call it the armature reactance. Now let's look at the phasor diagram. This is E, the one induced at no, at no load. We don't have any load. The generator is connected to the grid. Everything is good. And we have this voltage, FR. Uh, sorry, this magnetic field by the rotor. The current, when we have a current, this current will generate fs okay and 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 uh, and because of this current we have a component called e a r the armature act actance voltage okay this magnetic field the resultant magnetic field in the air gap generates an induced voltage this induced voltage i'm going to use a different color to make it clear so this Magnetic field generates this induced voltage. And as you can see, the angle is 90 degrees. You have 90 degrees phase shift. Okay. The submission of EAR and ESR gives us the one that we calculated in the beginning of this model. Okay. So now the question how to calculate ESR? To calculate ESR, Okay, we have to consider the terminal voltage. So this generator, I think I got a minute. I hope we can finish in one minute or two. So this volt, this generator has a terminal voltage V, but we are interested in getting a circuit that represents this black blocks, the generator. Okay, so there is, there is of course, a leakage reactance of any coil, like the stator itself, it's a coil. This coil has a leakage reactance, and it has a resistance. Okay, so the voltage drop across the leakage reactance, and the leakage reactance is just a reactance that does not uh, interact, uh, or it doesn't have any mutual effect uh, between the stator and the rotor. Okay, it is just a, a leakage reactance for the stator winding itself. 
like for example the transformer any transformer has a leakage reactance has a resistance okay so the relation between the terminal voltage the terminal voltage and this esr the e, uh, i mean the the induced voltage generated by the resultant magnetic field is given by this equation so there is a voltage drop across the leakage reactance and the resistance of the stator which gives us esr so now if you substitute for esr using this equation then you get this equation that represents the total the, the induced voltage at no at no load this is the induced voltage at no load and this is the rest okay we have the resistance of the coil we have the leakage reactants and we have the armature reactants the submission of these two reactances is xs which we call it the synchronous reactance okay so i know the time is over so i'm gonna stop at this point also i'm gonna briefly um, review it uh, in the beginning of the next lecture so if you have any quick questions i'm still uh, here uh, to answer your questions and of course you can leave um, uh, the session uh, if you have another uh, lectures or uh, other commitments um, uh, there is a question from Abdullah about the lab uh, so